Amen, amen. Good morning. Jesus is the only one who, who can, amen? Let's believe that today. We believe that this morning. He is the only one that can. Good morning, those of you who are watching online. We're excited today about a series that we're in called Jesus Is, and we're looking at the different things that Jesus called himself and described himself by. And this morning, before we get into that, I want to give you a quick commercial about our message notes. Uh, many of you have maybe heard in the church about the Church Center app. Steve's going to talk to you later about it in the service. But anyway, we have slid all of our information about our sermon notes from uh, the Uversion app to the Church Center app. It's going to kind of help us streamline everything. You can... You can do your tithe on there. All of our announcements are on there. Our sermon notes are on there. And not just the scriptures like on the YouVersion app, but we're going to have all the slides, all the content that you see on the overhead is, is there. So if you download the Church Center app, go to Message Notes, click on Pitnaz or Connecting Point, and you'll see all of our notes there. So just wanted to make that quick plug for you. But as I said, we're in a series called Jesus Is. We've been learning uh, these different attributes of God, and obviously, um, over this eight-week series, we are not even going to touch the surface on all that Jesus is and all the names um, of Jesus, but we are looking at a few that he called himself, and today we're looking specifically at Jesus is the great I am. Let's read that together. Jesus is I am, and I kind of, I grew up in the church, and when I was a kid, I would hear that scripture, I am, and I never really understood what it meant. It's kind of obscure for some of us to understand exactly what that means, but we're going to learn exactly what that's talking about when he says, Jesus is, I am. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn with me to John chapter 8, I'm just going to paraphrase quite a bit of the, the first part of it, but we're going to focus on the end part of John chapter 8, verses 58 forward on from there. But here's what's going on. The people of that time, the Israelites, the religious leaders at that time, had held uh, Abraham from the Old Testament in the highest regard. And when Jesus explains that he was before Abraham and greater than Abraham, it sets off a heated exchange uh, between Jesus and the people. So we're going to pick up in the middle of this discussion. Um, they are accusing Jesus. Jesus is, is explaining who he is. And so here we go, kind of picking up in the middle of that. Jesus says, I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Now, just real quick, a little context. Jesus is talking to these religious leaders among some other people. But these religious leaders have studied the law. They're very familiar with the law and they, they're familiar with Moses. They're familiar with Abraham. And they feel like they've cornered the market, so to speak, on on who God is and what God's about. And then you have this Messiah, you know, this person coming in claiming to be these things. And that's what's frustrating to them. I'm not seeking glory for myself, Jesus says, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. I tell you the truth. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. At this, the Jews exclaimed, now we know that you're demon possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets, yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. So they're ticked, they're frustrated, they're angry that he would even say something like this. And then they ask this question, not in a sincere way, but in a sarcastic, kind of angry way. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. And let's read this last sentence together. Who do you think... Now, how many of you have asked, maybe it was a child or an adult or somebody else, we've said those, that question, who do you think you are? Or if we've not said it out loud, we've thought it in our head, right? You're in line somewhere and someone cuts in front of you, you're like, who do you think you are? Go to the back of the line. Or, you know, in some other way, we've thought it or we said it, who do you think you are? And in this moment, they're asking Jesus, who do you think that you are? Are you greater than our father Abraham? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, now Jesus, you know, is basically saying, You claim it, right? Is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, 
So now Jesus is being accusatory towards these religious leaders and these people and essentially is calling them out and saying, though you do not know him, and they're saying, oh, we know him. He says, you don't know him, but Jesus says, but I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like, like what? So he is not mincing words. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham, that you are aware of, rejoiced at the, at the thought of seeing my day. So he's, he's claiming to be. He saw it and was what, church? He was glad. You are not 50 years old, they said. You're not even 50 years old, the Jews said to him. And you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Here we go. Before Abraham was born, I am. Now, he, he didn't say, before Abraham was born, I was. You know, I was born previous. He said, before Abraham was born, I am. He's identifying himself as the deity. At this, when he says this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. So there's, I've got two main facts, takeaways today that we're going to spend some time looking at today as we look at Jesus saying that he is the I am. Here's the first one. Christ was present in the past. He is present today and will continue to be present moving forward. Christ is I am. So what you need to know, and maybe you already know this, but when in the Old Testament, God is trying to get Moses to lead the people out of Egypt and out of bondage and into the, eventually into the desert, and then Joshua will lead them into the promised land. But essentially, he's talking to them, and he's giving God all these excuses as to why he doesn't want to go do it. And he says, hey, listen, I'm, I'm not good at speaking, and God provides him Aaron, and he has all these reasons. And eventually, he says, well, what am I supposed to tell them? He says in verse, Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they're going to ask me. They're going to talk to me. I know. It's like some of you know someone, you know, Hey, would you go ask your wife? If da, da, da. Hey, would you go ask your husband? Hey, would you go ask your boss? And you're like, I already know what they're going to say. I'm telling you, I already know what they're going to say. And Moses kind of, I don't know if that's kind of his sarcastic way of saying that or if he's just sincerely asking. But he says, what do I tell them? What is his name? Then what should I tell them? And God replies to Moses. Let's read those yellow words. I am. I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. When Jesus says, I am, in the New Testament, they are familiar with this scripture in the Old Testament. Know it, understand it, believe it. And now Jesus is claiming to be the Son of God, claiming to be um, a de the deity. He's claiming to be God. And that's what causes them to want to stone him at that time because they didn't believe that. So here's some things we need to know today. And there's some scriptures. If you want to take your phone out and take a photo of that, you can look at those scriptures later if you'd like to. But here's some things that we, we need to know. First of all, Christ is omniscient, he is omnipotent, and he is omnipresent, the great I am. Let's read that. Christ is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. Man, those are fun words. But let me just break those down for you for, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with those terms. Here's the first one. Christ is omniscient. He is all-knowing. Say that with me. He is all-knowing. Christ is all-knowing. There is nothing that you can bring to God that he doesn't understand or doesn't know. He is all-knowing. His, his wisdom knows no bounds. He is all-knowing. And there's no situation that you can go through that he can't relate to. He is all-knowing. Christ is omniscient. He is also omnipotent which means that he is all-powerful. Let's say that together. All-powerful. Um, we just sang about it earlier. He turns seas into highways. Christ, Mo Moses goes to the Red Sea, sticks his staff out, 
the, the waters part, and not only do the waters part, but the, the ocean floor is dried up, and the people walk through, and at his command, the waves go back on the, as they're chasing them. Christ is all-powerful. He's omniscient, all-knowing. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. And he's also omnipresent, which means he's everywhere at the same time. He was there on your worst day. He's there on your best day. He's there on the mundane days. There's no place that you can hide from the presence of God. You can't outrun God. We see scriptures along those lines. There is no place that you can run from God. And, and even on your worst day, he was there. He's omnipresent. We see in, in John, in the Gospel of John, there are seven different I am statements that we're going to look at. We've been looking at them, some of these, during this series, but we're also going to look at these today a little bit, not quite as in-depth as in, in coming weeks. But he says several things. Here's the first one. He says, I am the bread of life. Let's read that. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, which means that Jesus satisfies and sustains. Some of us are hungry for for love. We're hungry for attention. We're hungry for direction. We're hungry to be filled and satisfied. And Jesus is the bread of life. He is the bread of life. We also see in Scripture in John chapter 8, verse 12, uh, and also chapter 9, verse 5, he says, I am not only the bread of, the li- bread of life, but I am the light of the world. Let's say that together. I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light, and he also brings illumination. He is the light of the world. He brings illumination. And did you know that we can have his light living in us? For those of us who may be new to our church or, or new to church in general, or more importantly, new to talking about the Lord. As we grow up and as we're born, we're born in sin. and We're full of darkness. If you take a two-year-old and you take a toy away from a two-year-old, they're not going to say, yeah, you can have that. They're going to say, mine. They're, they're bent towards self. And when we invite Jesus into our heart and he comes in, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us and we're called to fan the flame, that fan that gift of salvation in us. And as we walk in him, we have his light inside of us. We aren't the light, but we have his light in us. Several years ago, I've shared this story before. I was in a, I went into this, this was years ago when you couldn't just download music. You had to like go into a music store to like get some music. <laughs> So I was in St. Louis, and I went in to get a CD, I think, for my wife. I know some of you don't even know what CDs are, but that means you definitely don't know what those eight-track tapes are. (laughs) But anyway, I went into this store, and as I walked in, and and again, I'm not the light, but the Holy Spirit, if you're you're saved, he's he's in you. And I walked in, and I just, like, there was just something dark about this place. Have you guys ever walked in somewhere? And, and the Holy Spirit inside of you just is kind of like, what is going on here? And I just, I, I, and I didn't know, I still don't know what that was, but I, I left. See, when we are walking with Jesus and his light is in us, he is going to reveal things to us sometimes. And everything that he reveals to us will always be supported in Scripture. So, real quick. If you feel that God is revealing something to you, some sort of light, but it doesn't go along with his word, then that's not Christ revealing that to you. That's something else. That's how we know that it's from the Lord is when it's confirmed by his word. Jesus is the light of the world, and through his death and resurrection, he brought salvation and brought light to all mankind. And also today, just because there's so many of us here and some watching online, someone in here today is feeling a little bit hopeless. I don't know who they are, but if you just do the math, there's too many in here. Someone's feeling hopeless. You're feeling down. You're feeling discouraged. You're feeling 
pushed on all sides. There's hope today. There's light at the end of that tunnel, that discouragement, through Jesus Christ. Amen? He's the vine. He supports us. He strengthens us. He sustains us. And he brings light. We also see in John that he's the door. Jesus says, I am the door. Um, my mom, several years ago, lived in Key West, Florida. And you could leave by plane, but if you were to drive into Key West, Florida, there's only one way in and one way out, unless something's changed. I haven't been there in a long time, but when I went there, there was one road in and one road out. There's only one way to get there and one way to leave. When I worked at a bank, I've shared this story many times, but it still works. I worked at Capital Federal Bank for years. I developed a, a friendship with this lady named Chris, and she was struggling in, in her life, and she looked at me one day while we were balancing our, our teller drawers, and she was talking to me about some personal stuff going on, and she knew I was a ministry student, and she said, well, Kyle, don't you believe there are many ways to God, which essentially would mean there's many doors to God? In fact, in my, na in my naivety, naivety, whatever that word is, I just assumed that most people understood there's only one way. I, you know, I don't know why, I just did. And Chris helped me realize there is a lot of people, even in churches, who think that there's many ways to God, that you can find your own path to God. Jesus is the only door. He's the only entrance. You also hear people say they don't like the idea of hell, that there's a hell. In fact, you, I mean, even in churches sometimes, you'll hear people say, well, I don't like the idea of hell. That's kind of scary. Well, here's my question. Why did Jesus come if there was no hell? We call him Savior because he saves us from hell. He saves us from eternal life apart from him. So when we read things like Jesus is the door, he is the entrance for salvation. And when we take communion periodically, we are remembering that he is the door. He brings salvation. Some of you can testify to how God has changed your life. Some of you I've talked to, some of you know people, and, and they say, man, I'm telling you, not only did he save me, but I was a different person before I met Jesus. The power of God, we talked about his omnipotence, the power of God can change a person's heart, can change their story. He is the door. Last week or the week before, we said Jesus is the good shepherd. He says, I am the door, I am the good shepherd. What do we think of when we think of a shepherd? You know, I used to kind of think of a shepherd only as someone with a gift of nurturing that was really good at nurturing people. You think of a, a sheep that breaks their leg and they sit down by a tree and they bandage the wound. And that is a shepherd. That's part of what a shepherd does. But you also want to know what a shepherd does? A shepherd protects. And a shepherd protects their flock. Jesus is the good shepherd. He protects his flock even to the point of death. He's the good shepherd. The good shepherd, he, or Jesus says, I am also the resurrection and the life. Let's read that. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus raises the dead to life. Aren't you glad? It wasn't just Lazarus that he, that he raised to life. He also raised himself to life on the third day and ascended into heaven. And he's still raising people spiritually to life today. Aren't you glad? That is amazing. He changes your story. One Easter several years ago, Steve did this incredible job of putting a, a video together. Some of you have seen videos where it'll say, I was a drug addict, and it flips it over and it says, I've been sober for a year because of Christ. And it's just story after story after story of people's lives being changed. Why? Because Jesus raises what's dead. That's good news today. Jesus raises what's dead. What your story is, 
doesn't have to be what your story will be. He also says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's say that together. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's saying, I am the way. I am the path. I am the truth. I am what you set your moral compass to. I am the life, the abundant life. Man, so many of us. I was watching this video on Facebook the other day, and I don't know how people feel about the getting their back popped or chiro chiropractors, and I'm not here to say that one way or another, but I watched this lady go in, and she's like, I've never been adjusted before. It was this video, and she goes in, and her neck's all stiff, and anyway, she, he, this guy pops her back and adjusts her neck, and it's like she's a totally different person. She says, I can't believe I've been walking around for the last however long living like this with a crink in my neck, and this guy stands here, and, and then I'm feeling better. And you know, so many uh, people, spiritually speaking, we walk around full of discouragement and disappointment and hopelessness or maybe even arrogance. And the whole time we have this abundant life waiting for us if we invite Jesus into our heart and we walk in his ways. Jesus is the resurrection. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. We said this a couple weeks ago. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Folks, we get our, our nourishment, our strength, our support, not from whether or not we have to wear masks, not from whoever we vote in as president, not from whether or not we like our in-laws or not, not whether or not we're good at sports or not, not whether our students at school like us or not, not whether we're making the money that we think we're worth or not. Not if we're a success in the world's eyes, not based on popular opinion. I mean, you fill in the blank, you fill in the blank, you fill in the blank. We don't get it from those things or those people. We get it from the true vine. Jesus is the true living vine that brings strength and nourishment out to each one of, each one of us. That was an amen part. Let's try that again. One, two, three. Because it's the truth. Here's our other fact today. Believing in God, but not believing that Jesus is the Son of God, will not set you free from sin, and it will not bring about salvation. That's what I told Chris that day when I was working at the bank. I think she said later, she said, well, I'm a good person, and I do a lot of good things for people. You know, Scripture says that none of us are good. When you compare your good deeds to God, Scripture calls them filthy rags. The only thing that makes us good is God. Listen to what Jesus says. You are from below and I am from above. You belong to this world and I don't. That is why I said that you will die in your sins. Okay, that's heavy. For unless you believe, let's read those two words, that I am, I guess that's three words, who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Catch that. For unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is what, church? A slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family. Hang on, the sentence isn't over. But a son is a part of the family. How long? Forever. So, if the son sets you free, let's finish it. If the son sets you free, is that like a song or something? So spiritual freedom is conditional. Being free spiritually from pornography, being set free from lust, 
being set free from addiction, being set free from a mindset that's not of God, of gossip, quarrel. I mean, the Colossians 3 lists all these different things that, that our sinful nature looks like. We see it also in Galatians chapter 5. If, if we have not asked Jesus into our heart, our identity is our sin. I love you all too much to not tell you that. As a pastor, I need to tell you that this morning. If you do not have Jesus in your heart, your sin, you are defined and tattooed and inked by your sin. And so am I and so is anybody else if we don't have Jesus in our heart. But if you've invited Jesus in the, into your heart, if you've asked for forgiveness from your sin, if you've repented of your sins, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. So that means if your mother or your father or your in-laws or somebody else looks at you and says, you remember 20 years ago when you did this? And you can look at them and say, I remember that, but that's not who I am anymore. Because if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. Man, don't we, when we start to feel bad about ourselves, aren't we tempted to try to drag people down? You got that one family member, that one person that will never forget, let you forget what you did or what you let happen, or, or whatever it might be. Jesus died so that you didn't have to be inked with your sin, but you could be inked with salvation. That you could be set free. Man, I don't know about you, but... I wouldn't want every decision and action I've ever made in my life to be played up on the screen. Anybody else? And Christ came and he became our sin and, and he was our sin. And he said, it is finished, which means there's nothing that we can add or take away from what he's done. And if we accept Jesus into our hearts, the old is gone and the new has come. And we can take, I mean, I don't know what size yours is, but I'll just use this as an example. We can take whatever the ugly and the sin, maybe it's bigger than this. We can take all of that. No, for real, you can do this. It's a true story. You can come and you can lay that at Jesus' feet and you can feel remorse and, and, and repent and say, that's not who I want to be in anymore. And instead of you, you drop that off and God gives you salvation, he gives you the fruit of his spirit, he gives you love, he gives you joy, he gives you peace. He gives you kindness. He gives you patience. He gives you faithfulness. He gives you gentleness. He gives you self-control. If the Son sets you free, let's read it, you are truly free. Listen to what Max Lucado says. Though the Bible was written over 16 centuries by at least 40 authors, it has one central theme. Let's read it. Salvation through faith. Does it say good works? Salvation through faith in faithful church attendance. Salvation through faith in reading your Bible through once a year. Salvation through faith in not having something you not having some really bad thing you've done in your life. Salvation through faith in your parents and your grandparents served the Lord, and even though you don't serve the Lord, they did. So you'll you got faith through. No, it doesn't say that. It says fa salvation through faith in Christ. A. W. Tozer says Jesus is not one of many ways to approach God, nor is He the best of several ways. Let's read it. He is. So as we wrap this up today, I've got a couple questions for you. Have you been set free by the great I am? Does your life reflect that you've been set free by the great I am? Let's start with the first one. Have you been set free by the great I am? 
And I don't mean you come to church every week or you watch online every week or maybe a combination of both. I'm not asking you if you pay your tithe every week. I'm not asking you if you're a good person compared to somebody else. Have you got alone with God and been remorseful for the fact that you, you're a sinner? And I'm a sinner. And stood before God and said, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that you have saved me from my sins. I acknowledge, Lord Jesus, that without you, I am not set free. But I receive from your word the gift of salvation. It says if we confess with our mouth and we believe in our hearts, we can be saved. Have you been set free? I want to just take a moment real quick. Just if everybody bow their heads and close their eyes and those, those online. Some of you have been set free, so be patient. But there's other people in here maybe haven't been. If you don't know Jesus, I don't want to let this window pass. If you'd like to receive Jesus into your heart, you'd like him to be in your heart, then you just simply need to recognize that you're a sinner. So you can say that to him. You don't have to open your mouth. You can just say that, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've made bad decisions. But Father, I hear to this morning from your word that I can be set free. And so Father, I invite you into my heart today. I ask that you would fill me with the fruits of the Spirit. I give you, Lord, the things that are not of you. Maybe there's a sin in your life or a couple sins in your life that have defined who you are and they're, they're tripping you up. Would you just confess that to Jesus today and say, Lord, come into my heart and save me. And Father, I follow you, Lord, not based on feelings and emotions. I follow you in faith. I trust you when I can't see you. I trust you, Lord. I trust your word, and I choose to believe what you tell me. I repent of my sins, and I invite you into my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that today, I'd encourage you to, to get with one of us pastors or tell someone who's a Christian. If you need a Bible, we'd like, love to give you one. Have you been set free? Second question to those of you who would say, yes, I've been set free. I've been following Jesus my whole life. I've heard this sermon and sermons like it all the time. I could preach it for you. Probably better. Okay, well then my question is, does your life reflect that you've been set free by the great I am? I don't mean that sarcastically, like, because I'm saying it doesn't. I'm not saying it. I'm just asking, like, does it reflect that you've been set free by the great I am. If I were to go to your employment and I were to ask one of your coworkers, based on your coworkers' actions, the things they say out their mouth, the way that they talk to people, the way that they treat, I mean, all of that, would you say that they follow Jesus? What would they say? That's a tough question to ask, isn't it? For all of us. And as I ask that question, if you're not real confident in what you think people might say, you don't need to beat yourself up. You just simply need to say, Lord, help. This last Wednesday night, I was talking to the teens, and the message was called help. That we lose the pride, and we say, Jesus, help me with my tongue. Jesus, help me with my temper. Jesus, help me with my impatience. Lord Jesus, help me in this way to reflect your nature, not just at church or around certain groups of people. Lord, would you help me to look and be free in every moment, in every way? Which is our action step. 
Be set free. Live set free. And testify that if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Let's read that. Be set free. Live set free. And testify that if the Son sets you free, you are free. Jesus says, I am. I am what you need. Before Abraham was, I am. While you religious people are talking to me, I am. In Philippians chapter 2, when it says, Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, I am. That's me, Jesus. And when we all stand before God someday, every single one of us will, no matter what your theology is, you and I are going to stand before God someday and we're going to give an account for our life. And what is going to determine where we spend eternity is if we know the great I am. If our name is in that book of life, do you know him? And if you know him, who do you know that doesn't know him? There's too many of us in here. We know someone who doesn't know Jesus. We have names on these prodigal boards of people who don't know Christ. Their first names. For those of you who don't know that are new, we wrote first names only on these prodigal boards of people that we're praying for that don't know Christ. We're going to ask our band to come at this time. I invite you guys to stand. And if you don't know Jesus and you'd like to know him, you can come pray with Adam or I. You can come and pray at one of these altars. If you know someone who doesn't know Jesus, you can come and pray at one of these altars. Or you can pray right where you're at. We talk a, a lot about windows. You know, don't miss the window. You see these ads on TV that says, if you call right now, you can get it for $19.99. Don't miss the window. For those of you who may not know, the Holy Spirit is here. And we have a window where we could fix things with God or, or let God speak to us. Pray for somebody who's lost. Pray for somebody you know that's lost. Make a decision to follow Jesus with all your heart. We could take advantage of the window. Or what we could do, what some of us do, probably more than we want to admit, just let the window pass by because we'll catch the next one. And there might be a next window there might not be. He is the great I am. He's the great I am. You hear those stories where the guy or this girl, they're looking for all, you know, they're looking for a spouse and they spend their whole time looking for someone and then right there in front of them is like their best friend. They end up marrying and they're like, the whole time they were right here and I just missed them. They were literally right here and I just kept looking past them. These religious leaders are sitting there, right there. Jesus is talking to them and they're missing it right in front of their face. He's here right now too. Right here, church. You may can't physically see him, but he's here. He's in our midst. What do you need to talk to him about? What do you need to say to him? How do you want to praise him? Lord Jesus, God, we thank you today that you are the great I am. Father, we sent your presence is here. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. Father, if there's something in our lives we need to get right, I pray that we would do that. Lord, if there's someone we know that needs to get their life right, I pray that we'd pray for them today. And most importantly, Lord, may we embrace that you are the great I am.